Camilla Tioli worked in a mill, went on strike, and testified before a congressional committee all before she turned 15. This video includes her actual testimony. Now, did you ever get hurt in the mill? Yes. Can you tell the committee about that? How it happened and what it was? Well, I used to go to school and then a man came up to my house and asked my father why I didn't go to work. So my father says, I don't know whether she's 13 or 14 years old. So the man say, you give me four dollars and I will make the papers come from the old country saying you're 14. So my father gave him the four dollars and in one month came the papers that I was 14. I went to work and about two weeks later got hurt in my head. Well, how were you hurt? The machine pulled the scalp off. Were you in the hospital after that? I was in the hospital seven months. Are you one of the strikers? Yes. Why did you do that? Because I didn't get enough to eat at home. You did not get enough to eat at home? No. Camilla Tioli, an Italian-American girl, was just 14 when she agreed to answer questions about working conditions in the textile industry. I learned about her while doing research for the archives. My family is Italian, and my grandfather worked in the mills around the same time as Camilla. Apart from her testimony and her accident, we know very little about Camilla Tioli. But we can assume that Camilla was like many other immigrant children whose families crossed the Atlantic to work in the mill towns of America. Camilla's family, including five children, left Italy for Lawrence, Massachusetts in 1900. In Lawrence, they joined a workforce of Russian, Italian, Irish, Polish, Jewish, Lithuanian, and Portuguese immigrants. 40,000 people speaking 25 different languages worked in the Lawrence Mills. More than half the workers were women and children. High rents and low pay made it impossible for one wage earner to support a family. The mills separated workers according to their ethnic backgrounds. Camilla changed spools in a spinning room alongside other Italian Americans. She was paid $4 for a 48-hour work week. Every two weeks, her employer deducted 10 cents for her drinking water. Camilla's home was a cramped, dilapidated wooden tenement. The rooms were small, dark, and damp. Camilla's basic diet consisted of bread, molasses, and beans. Usually, milk wasn't safe to drink. If it was fresh, it was, at seven cents a quart, too expensive. Filth and disease were widespread. Children, some of them as young as seven or eight, stopped going to school to work in the mills. It was hard to spend long work days in such a dusty, hot, and noisy environment. Camilla was about 12 years old at the time of her accident. Mr. Kitchen, I understand that you can give the committee the particulars regarding that young girl. I will read you the data I have. It says here, Camilla Tioli, Injured July 9th, 1909. Excision of portion of scalp. Taken to hospital with two pieces of scalp wrapped up in newspaper. She claimed that a boy pushed her and her hair was caught in machinery. The facts, according to our records, are these. She was supposed to leave work at 6 o'clock. At 5.30, she took down her hair. This is against the rules, and we have notices posted in all the rooms. She took her hair down and was combing it over her head, forward. One of her mates called to her, and she threw her hair back. And then it went in between two gears and pulled a part of her scalp off. As a doffer, Camilla had to work quickly 
to replace spools full of yarn and to remove empties. Despite what Mr. Kitchen, a representative of the mill, implied, an accident like hers was not so unusual, given the hazards of a mill job. During a conference on child labor, reformers in Massachusetts had tried to reduce those hazards, proposing laws to improve working conditions for children. In 1912, the state legislature passed a law reducing the number of hours women and children could work from 56 to 54 hours a week. The mill owners sped up the machines to make up for the loss of time. Some workers had to operate two machines at once. Then, without informing their employees, the owners cut two hours pay from the workers' wages. Polish American workers were the first to react to the decrease in pay. On January 11th, they walked off the job. On January 12th, Italian-American mill workers followed, including Camilla and her father. Eventually, more than 25,000 workers from 11 mills participated in the strike. The Industrial Workers of the World, a union known for organizing unskilled laborers, was called in to help. IWW leaders formed a strike committee to coordinate picketing, relief, and strike tactics. The committee drew up a list of demands. Police and strikers got into violent confrontations. The governor ordered the state militia into Lawrence. In addition to the violence, the children suffered through a harsh winter, made worse by food and clothing shortages. Two activists, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn and Margaret Sanger, organized a children's exodus they sent workers' children to be cared for by sympathizers in other cities. Local authorities claimed that the IWW had exploited the children and had placed them in unreliable homes without their parents' permission. Strikers faced arrest if they took part in any more children's schemes. The strikers tried to send another group of children away. At the railroad station, police officers beat and clubbed the panicked crowd. Fifteen children and their parents were arrested. The country was horrified. The U.S. Congress called for a special investigation, and a delegation of 16 children, chaperoned by Flynn and Sanger, told their stories. Camilla was among them. Are you working now? Yes, sir. How long did you go to school? I left when I was in the sixth grade. And you have been working ever since, except while you were in the hospital. Yes, sir. After Camilla and the other witnesses testified, President Taft ordered an investigation into labor conditions. On March 12th, the mill owners gave in to all the demands. And on March 14th, the strikers voted to accept. Camilla recovered from her injury, but she was left with a permanent scar, a six-inch bald spot on the back of her head. Camilla's fame lasted only a few days, but her testimony let the public see the very real suffering of a young immigrant worker and helped pave the way for important labor reforms. <laughs>